Okay, folks, welcome back. Before we get into the topic, it's very important that we remind ourselves that this is a commodity market discussion, and it's important that you read the disclaimers here. I am not a CTA. I'm not a commodity trade advisor, so it's very important that you understand that everything we say here is all specifically talking about paper trading only. Okay, folks, welcome back to Lesson 3. This is June 2017, ICT Mentorship, Commodity Trading. Lesson number three, Seasonal Tendencies, my personal favorites. Okay, we're looking at the first on our list, and we're going to be talking about the agricultural markets first, and then we'll go into the financials. But before I begin, I want to, number one, stress that panaceas don't exist, be-all, end-alls don't exist in trading, and certainly seasonal tendencies are not one. Uh, while my personal belief is that there's validity behind them uh, because of human error, because of the seasonal tendency not taking effect of the time of uh, a trader sitting down and trying to implement them, just know that you can lose money if you try to place all of your faith on seasonal tendencies. But my personal interpretation of seasonal tendencies are it's like a roadmap or like a treasure map, if you will. It kind of like gives me the normal expectation of what should normally be seen in price action that time of year. Now, anything can happen, obviously, with agriculturals. There could be a drought. There could be a bumper crop, meaning there's a lot of supply. And a drought would create a short supply, and demand would go up, and obviously the prices would go through the roof. But when we have these seasonal tendencies, again, it's important that we remind ourselves, like I did when I mentioned them earlier in the mentorship, that they're not panaceas. They are not going to be absolute, but they're good roadmaps as to what to expect for each individual, in this case, commodity. So the first in our list here. The seasonal tendency for the soybean market, on the left-hand side of every slide I show you, I'm going to present the seasonal tendency on the left and then a weekly chart over the last five years. So that way you can look at price and form for your own opinion whether there's, a, whether there's any validity to having these seasonal tendencies in our toolbox at all. I believe by your study and your interest, by seeing whether these things come to fruition or not in the old data, I think you'll come to the conclusion like I did that there's something going on that, in my opinion, provides validity and not entire trust, but certainly one to look for reasons to expect the market to perform as we would see in a seasonal tendency. If we don't see the market trading in line with what the seasonal tendency is implying, that actually gives us insight as well. So if at a time when it should be bullish, for instance, with the soybean markets, usually the 1st of February going into the June time period, usually the bullish time period for a soybean market. But if the market's actually trading lower, what is that telling you? It means seasonally and uh, influences are not under influence at all. They have no impact at all on price. And there's probably something underlying that's, heavily uh, slanted towards a big supply of soybeans and otherwise the normal function for higher prices and markup in the price for soybeans isn't being seen so if we're seeing bearishness during the first half or so of the year that means there's probably a whole lot of soybeans you know that's available and there's going to be so much supply that demand won't push prices higher but if there is a condition where we're expecting bullishness, like we see here in the first half of the year generally, if that occurs and we are in a primary bull market or other reasons that would support bullishness are seen in price action, then we could look for the seasonal tendency to support a sustained move going into the middle of the year. Interesting enough, uh, June time period going into July creates a seasonal tendency to create a high. And then usually it trades down into the September-October time period where it creates another seasonal low. If we look at the top of every one of these seasonal tendencies, you're going to see a small little yellow box here. And the first in the series from left to right, you see MAR. It stands for the March delivery contract for soybeans. The next delivery contract when March contract expires. 
You can no longer trade that contract. You have to trade the next month, which would be May. When May expires, you have to trade July. When July expires, you have to trade August. When August expires, you have to trade September. When September expires, you can trade November. When November expires, the next month would be January. Obviously, you want to always try to trade the first or nearby month because that's where all the open interest is generally. Uh, there's a few commodities that don't always operate like that, like gold uh, usually has uh, you know, a tendency to skip a month in the latter portions of the year. But the easiest way to do is go into the barchart.com and you pull up the contracts that you would be doing your analysis on. Just look at open interest and volume, whatever has the highest one. That's usually the, the contract you're going to be looking at or, or looking to trade. On the seasonal tendencies, there's two lines. There's a solid black line, which delineates 40 years of price data. So that way we can look at the seasonal tendency pattern for the last 40 years. And Steve Moore, who creates this wonderful resource, also plotted a 15-year seasonal tendency pattern. And the reason for doing that is when we have a short-term view of a tendency or data and you compare it with a longer term sample size like 40 years contrasted with 15 years of the same information if there is a strong seasonal tendency there that means we should be able to see it both in the short term 15 year data and the 40 year and you can see by contrast the heavy solid black line and the dashed red line pretty much move lockstep to the same direction. So in, when we look at the seasonal tendencies, we're looking for that criteria where both of them agree to create a high or a low and sustain moves. So in this case, for soybeans, we can see the 1st of February, there's a seasonal tendency for soybeans to rally going up into the mid portion of the year, June or July. And then June, July, we create a high and trades down into September, October, creating another seasonal low. On the right-hand side of every one of the slides I'm going to provide you in this teaching, I am not doing any markups at all because I do not want to give the impression or imply that these seasonal tendencies are absolute. I'm not trying to overprove them. I'm only suggesting that you look at the data and you tell for yourself whether there's any validity to it. Okay, and don't just use the last five years data like I'm showing you here. Go back as far as you possibly can and see if these things do in fact materialize. And I think you're going to be rather surprised when you see how consistent many of them are. So we know that there is a seasonal tendency for price for soybeans to rally around the beginning of the year. So we can look for the January delineation at the bottom of the weekly chart on the right hand side. And we should see price rally up into July. And if you look at January 2013, follow that up with your eye, you'll see there's a low and it trades all the way up into July of that year. Very phenomenal, very, very consistent with the seasonal tendency. Then in July, we expect price to trade down into a fall, September, October time period. And it creates a seasonal low in October and consolidates a little bit and then rallies again in January of 2014 into the June month, creating a high for 2014, trading all the way down into what, yep, you guessed it, the September, October low for 2014. The 2016 time period, you can see that the seasonal influence for price to rally for soybeans comes in effect again, making the high in the month of June of 2016, then trading lower, making the low in October. So I'm going to counsel you to weigh it out for yourself whether or not there's a seasonal tendency here. <laughs> so if we are a commodity trader in the making and we want to paper trade and see if there's any validity to these things, we know that there are strong tendencies to trade soybeans three ways. Look for longs from February going into June, July. Look for shorts from June, July down into September, October. Look for longs September, October going into the following rotation in the summer months. Now that may break up into two stages or two legs in price action, but that's how you use the seasonal tendency or at least how I interpret it and how it's served me well over the last 20 years. The next seasonal tendency is Chicago Port of Trade wheat 
Now this one's a little funky, but it's when it's there, it's solid. Um, there is a seasonal tendency for wheat to decline the first half of the year and then make a low second half of June and in August. So we have a little bit of a time period between four to six weeks where the low could form. And if we look at the July time period on the weekly chart, you can see that there's generally a rally like in 2012. We can see the rally in wheat. And in the 2013 year, we saw price decline a little bit. That year didn't have the seasonal influence for bullishness there. Uh, same thing with 2014. And in 2015, we saw the market rally going into the July time period. And in the 2016 time period, the bullishness was also not seen as well. And this year we haven't got to July yet. We can see clearly that the wheat market has been in a strong bearish market. And now by using that seasonal tendency, let's look and see if there's any influences for sell-offs from the beginning of the year in January going down into June. So we can find the first January in our weekly chart is in January 2013. Follow that line straight up and you can see there was a high formed around the $8 a bushel and price traded lower. As a result, down into, yes, the July time period. And in 2014, we actually seen the price only decline for about a month in January 2014, then it rallied. Then the following year in January 2015, we seen price decline a little bit and traded down into what looks like uh, May, and then May created a low and started the rally. And in 2016, we saw the market decline, and while it did have a retracement above the $5 mark, uh, it did trade down into a low of the July-August time period. And in January 2017, we did not see a, a decline, we actually saw the rally. So there's times when the seasonal tendency will not be of any significance at all won't have any impact on price but if we ever see the wheat market go into a bull market the best times to be a buyer that i've seen in historical price action you can see it for yourself is to look for a low in the july august time period and then in november so november and july august they're the best times to be a buyer of wheat when markets are in bear markets like we've seen in the week market here. If wheat is in a bearish market, best times to look for sales is the beginning of the year going down into the summer months. Chicago Board of Trade corn. Okay, so the best time to be looking for shorts, obviously you can see it jump off of the, the seasonal tendency chart here, is in May. May and June create seasonal tendencies for corn historically over the last 40 years. And it usually drops down into September, October time period of the year where it makes a seasonal low. So we can check, check this by looking at the April time on our weekly chart and find an April and see if it declines down into September, October. So the first one we can see in 2013, it creates a little bit of a retracement, but falls out of bed in July down into the October time period. Then in April of 2014, it creates the very high of that particular year, trades down into October, uh, September, October, creates the low. Then in the following 2015 year, we can see that April has a decline. Uh, it does rally a little bit early in 2015, creates a high and sells off again, but can't get below the 350. And actually, 350 stays a support level for a number of months going into 2016. So we don't see any decline in April. We actually see it rally. And that's actually strong because what we're seeing is, is the seasonal tendency for corn to actually be declining in the spring. It can't. It's finding support off of a historical $3.50 a bushel price mark. And it rallies up and, and challenges an old high seen in July of 2015. Then price creates a low in the 
September time period when we expect a low, and that's been seen in 2016, and corn has been steadily moving sideways to slightly higher since that price point. And we didn't see any decline. Notice that in April, May of this year, we've actually seen corn go higher. So that I think we have a little bit of a sleeper market, meaning that we might see some bullishness for the corn market because it's not abiding by its seasonal tendency. So if it's not doing that, what is it telling us? Underlying relative strength. Okay, the next one is feeder cattle. You eat hamburgers. This is where it comes from, <laughs> if you're wondering what a feeder cattle is. All right, so if we look at the seasonal tendency for this commodity, uh, it usually makes a seasonal low in the April-May time period. It can occur as early as February. If you look at the dashed red line, in the last 15 years, there's been an imp impulse to create a seasonal low as early as February, but generally um, the best moves, as you can see in the dashed line, it really starts to move higher at the end of April going into May, and it creates some seasonal high in around August and September, then it goes into consolidation. So how do we use this information? It's ideally a good time to be a buyer in the spring and sell it going into the fall. So if we can find April and look for basically October. So between April and October, there should be a rally. So if we look at the April delineation for 2013, we can see the market rallied in fact from that spring time period all the way up into the october high of 2013 nails the um, short-term high then it consolidates just like the seasonal tendency does then in 2014 we see the rally going all the way up into the very high of the feeder cattle market in october 2014 then in april 2015 we see price rallying again but it falls out of bed a little early so in august of that month or that year, we can see that it had already started to decline, but we still saw an impulse of price to move higher in the feeder cattle market after a long-term breakdown in market structure. And in 2016, we see price actually not see the seasonal tendency have any impact whatsoever because of the overall bearishness on feeder cattle. Then in this year, 2017, we can see that April created a nice little short-term low at the $1.30. And then it rallied, and we've since rallied up to 160, which is a phenomenal price move for feeder cattle. And it, we still may even go higher, but looking at what's already happened this year, it's been a nice uh, rally from the 130 level up to 160. Every 100 basis points or one full point or handle is $500 per contract for feeder cattle. Okay, the next one is live cattle. This is what you get before you get a hamburger. <laughs> These are the living, breathing cows. So the seasonal tendency for this commodity is a high forming in the February-March time period and a seasonal low forming in June. So ideally, the stronger impulse is to see a low form in June. So there's usually a markup period seen in the middle of the year going into the end of the year. So it's real easy to use that information by looking for July, essentially on the weekly chart. Find July and see if that creates a low up into the January time period. So that way we can see the weekly chart. So find a July in 2012 and look at the January 2013. You can see it did in fact rally that between these two price points. Then in 2013, we can see that it did rally as well in June of that year, all the way up into the end of 2013 going into uh, 2014. Then again in 2014, June, it creates the low of the year, and then it rallies incredibly going up and creating the high of the year in what looks like November. And then in the following year, um, we had the market in a bear market and influ uh, influenced by seasonal tendency didn't, didn't have any impact at all during the June, July time period. But the sell off in February, March, starting in 2015, you can see that they actually called really nice shorts and tops in the marketplace. And as the market was bearish, the January, February, March time period each year was creating the really nice sell offs as the market was bearish.
and then we created a nice low in 2016 in the October time period, which doesn't fit anything seasonally, but we started to trade higher. And now this year we saw the market have a little bit of a decline in the February, March going into April, but then April, May, and June, we're seeing the effects of that seasonal tendency here with higher prices on cattle. So again, really strong seasonal tendency here. If you can blend it with technicals, it's a really strong one. The next one is lean hogs. Okay, if you like your bacon cheeseburgers, this is where your bacon comes from. You used to do uh, pork bellies, but uh, they don't trade those anymore. All right, so we're looking at the seasonal tendency for this one. And in my opinion, and please take this with a grain of salt, if you're looking for a seasonal tendency that is one of a dandy, this is like, this is the closest thing to perfection in terms of my ability to you know, find and study things over historical data. This one here is a super one. This one is a buy in March, April, and in a high forming in May, June, down into a seasonal low of September and October. Okay, so primarily, if you're going to be a buyer of lean hogs, we're going to be looking for a buy around the February, March time period. Basically, we look for April on our weekly chart and just go to the left of it one line, and you should see a seasonal low at that time period. So we're going to look at 2013's April. Go one vertical line to the left of the April delineation, and that's going to be March. And you can see that it nails the 2013 low, and it rallies all the way up into July, creates the seasonal tendency to high, and falls out of bed. The next year, you can see in 2014, we get a phenomenal opportunity to see February, March time period seasonal tendency rally. It goes vertical. It goes insanely high, way high. That is a millionaire maker. That right there is a mega trade. That's what it looks like. When you see types of moves like that, it's it's hard not to be pleased with a move like that. It's incredible. And the seasonal tendency high forming in July. Well, look what happened in 2014. It nailed the high. Then in the 2015 time period, you can see the seasonal tendency as well occurs in March. It rallies up into the June-July time period, creates the seasonal tendency high, and falls out of bed. The following year, again, we see the March-April time period creates the seasonal low. It rallies up into June-July, creates the high, sells off, goes down into September-October. And this year, we saw... Again, the March-April time period seasonal tendency for lean hogs to rally, and it has done so in stunning fashion. So this one here is one of those best-kept secrets traders that trade commodities. They probably never see this, but I can tell you everyone that trades commodities professionally and they trade agriculturals, they trade this one every year. All right, seasonal tendencies for cocoa. All right, uh, you like your cocoa, hot chocolate, uh, you like all uh, your candies. Well, that's where we're getting it from, cocoa. So the seasonal tendency for this one here, while it's muddy a little bit, if you look at it, um, the best ones I see are a low to form May, June, up into the September, October time period. So we're looking for a seasonal high to form, basically the last week of August going in September and making a seasonal low last week of May going in the first week of June. So we can find July in our chart and go over one to the left, one vertical line to the left, and there should be a seasonal low forming, trading up into October time period. So let's test that out on the 2013 year. So we're gonna look for the July of 2000, well, it started on, on 2012, Michael. Uh, you can see that there was a, certainly a rally that traded up into the September time period in 2012 and we see it occur in 2013 we see it occur in 2014 we see it occur in 2015 is a rally that we actually did a study on last year if you were following me as um, part of a uh, the live session I was doing on YouTube uh, we did a, a case study on the cocoa market as a buy 
trading out to that uh, 3200 and 3250 level, which ended up becoming uh, uh, a pretty neat uh, case study. We used some options in there, and even though uh, it didn't trade long term, a lot longer, higher uh, price move, it did go to right where we were looking for, and we saw doubles and triples on our options as, as, a, as a paper trade. And in 2017, uh, we're entering obviously the same type of thing here. We see Coco rallying from the 1800 level up almost to the 2100 level. So we saw that same influence as well with the seasonal tendency. Okay, this one here, orange juice. This one has has a strong tendency for September, October low to form and then rally. So basically the easiest thing to do is find in October and see if it creates a low and see if it rallies into December or basically one vertical line to the January mark to the left. Okay, so we can see that that rally did occur in 2012. It did occur in 2013. It did occur in one, one month late in, in 2014. Nailed it on 2015. Nailed it in 2016. And we'll have to see if it's going to do it this year. Okay, coffee. I liked this coffee market when I was a, a more active commodity trader. I don't trade commodities anymore, but when I was, I was always following coffee. And this pair, when it moves, it can move a lot. And its best time to be a buy is June, July. Um, you can see that the last 15 years, there's been a seasonal tendency for it to create a low in mid of June. But seasonally, over historical long period of time, 40 years, it's usually the month of July. And if we go and look at every July, you can see that it does create a low in 2012. Uh, it doesn't create so much of one in 2013. Does nail one beautifully in the 2014 year in July. And doesn't do so much of a, a job of it in 2015. Does a wonderful job in 2016. And I'm almost certain we'll probably see one of those occur this year. So we'll be watching the uh, coffee market going into the next month of 2017. For bearishness, uh, the ideal scenario is to look for April, May high. And we can see by looking in the time when the market was bearish, April creates a April, May time period in 2013 as a nice sell off there. Uh, it creates a high in 2014, sells off rather nicely there. And in 2015, when it was bearish, the April, May time period created a nice sell off. Took a little bit of time lethargically, but it went down from this time of the year. Um, we had a small little retracement lower in 2016, nothing of any real significance. But this year, we have seen the um, April, May time period create bearishness for the coffee market. And we're seeing that here in price action. Okay, seasonal tendency next that ends our discussion for the agriculturals is cotton. A very strong one to sell off in the May time period. So we can look for the April portion of our weekly chart and see if there's any sell-offs from April. And you can see in 2013, a really nice sell-off from the 94 cents a pound in cotton. And it trades down to 80, so that's 14 cents. Each one full handle is $500 for this commodity. And the next one we have in 2014 creates the high of the year and sells off rather precipitously. Many, many, many handles lower. And in 2015, we had some consolidation, as you would probably expect after a big move like that we saw in 2014 moves in consolidation, but yet it still had a little bit of a, uh, a sell-off where it moved about 400 uh, basis points or $2,000. Then in 2016, uh, we did not see so much of a high sell-off in April. Uh, we ended up seeing the low form and it started rallying. So that actually shown how the bearishness that would be expected in the seasonal tendency for cotton in April, May, we saw it rallying. And that's going to be an opposing force showing you that if it's not following the normal business routine of selling off in the spring, 
it's showing you there's been a strong underlying strength behind this commodity and you can see it's been straight up since then and in the following year uh, what we're, we're now time of year this recording is 2017 we did not see a sell-off again either of any importance we only saw like 300 basis points sell off from 78 to 74 but it rallied precipitously going into the 87 cents a pound okay first in our discussion of the financials we're looking at crude oil Strong tendency in the beginning of the year, the rally, and creating a seasonal tendency high in September, October time period. So we can look in January of 2013. We can see that it did, in fact, uh, in this case, sell off a little bit. Didn't have the seasonal tendency there. Uh, but we did see a decline in the September, October time period of that year. It creates the high. And then we have in January 2014, the crude oil market did, in fact, rally. Traded up into the month of June of that year in 2014, creating the high. And then it sold off rather aggressively. And we see in the following year, 2015, we see a seasonal tendency for it to rally, and it does. It does so for about uh, 1,500 basis points. And then we see price in 2015, we see September, October, seasonal tendency create a high around that $15 a barrel mark. And trades down into the seasonal low that we'd be expected to see January of 2016 and price rallies all the way up into what we saw for the seasonal tendency outline to the left perfectly delivered and then we saw price consolidating at the beginning of 2017 and then slowly dropping lower so there's been no seasonal tendency support for bullishness in the first half of this year price has been going lower so what is it telling you there's a lot of supply on the oil market so we're going to probably see oil trade lower because there's been no significance on the upside when there seasonally should be okay the next one is the high-grade copper market and again this is kind of like wheat it's kind of iffy best times to be buying copper are the months of june and the month of november best scenario for selling is september and April okay so we're gonna look for April to create a high we can see that April sold off in 2013 it sold off in 2015 and we had a sell-off in 2016 and we had a little bit of a sell-off this year um, for the, the long side let's find the July time period and see if to the left of it for June creates a low in 2012 we see it happening there seasonal tendency long seasonal tendency long for 2013 in june that came to fruition 2014 we had a little bit of a long also in copper and in 2015 we did not have the seasonal low formation of the seasonal tendency uh buy that would be normally expected in june july 2015 didn't have it did have a sell-off in that month, at year September, so we had a seasonal tendency for bearishness to come into effect. And in 2016, had a little bit of a sell-off, but it's, it consolidated, and we've stayed in a range for the entire, basically the majority of 2016. And finally, it rallied in the November time period, October November time period of 2016. And then in April of this year, we saw that seasonal tendency so far declined a little bit as well. So when copper goes into a premium, which we'll learn about in the next lesson, uh, this is one of those metals that can do extremely, extremely well. And if it's bullish and the seasonal tendency says that June and November is a good time to be a buyer and it has a premium, this market can really, really move. Okay, gold, this one's a really simple one. It's a buyer's market. So we look for the July, August low, the form, and that's it. We don't look for anything else. Um, you can look for a sell-off in January, February if you really want to be hard-pressed for a short, but generally the ideal scenario is to look for longs. And the reason why all the jewelry that gets sold at the end of the year, Christmas time and New Year's and all that business, 
Uh, it has to be obviously mined. It has to be stored. It has to be processed. It has to be turned into the jewelry and then put to market early enough so that way everyone can buy it, wrap it up, and put it underneath the tree by the end of the year for Christmas. So the seasonal tendency for gold is just that. So we're going to look for July to create the lows. So if we go into July 2012, lo and behold, we have a rally in gold. And we see a rally in 2013 in July. We see a high form in 2014. There's a rally that forms in 2015 in July. There's a rally that occurs in June, July of 2016. It ends up making a high. And then, well, we're, we don't have July yet. We'll, July will be next month. So we'll see if we get that rally occur in gold. Okay, lastly, in our series of seasonal tendencies is the silver market. Much like gold, we're looking for July-August time period for a low, and silver can make a selling point in February. But we're focusing primarily on being a buyer of silver, because if this market does go into a parabolic bull market, which it tends to do that every 10 or 12 years, um, if you look at what we've been seeing here for the long term, silver looks like it's poised to make a nice run, and it could go up to the 27s, maybe even 28s, and you'll see why I was bullish in the time we've been spending together in this mentorship, why I believe this metal could have some real legs with it and go higher. doesn't mean it can't go higher than 20 if it gets on a rip, but that's where I think it's going to go over the next 18 months or so. So if we see the seasonal tendency for silver to occur in the uh, July-August time period, we can anticipate the July low to form. So we'll find all the Julys and see if there's a low forming. 2012, the low in July. 2013, a low in July, and there's a high forming in 2014, and there's a small little consolidation in 2015. 2016, we had price rally up and then create a high in July, and we are getting ready to have July this year for 2017, so we'll see if we have that bullishness of an impulse to send silver higher. That is concludes the discussion for the seasonal tendencies because I've already mentioned the commodities for ComDolls in our discussion earlier in this mentorship when I discussed all seasonal tendencies for currencies and how they relate to Forex. Um, I'm not going to use the bond market or debt instruments either because I use those also in the discussion for seasonal tendencies. So these are the markets I like. Uh, there's other commodities that you can trade. Obviously, you can trade canola, you can trade rice, you can trade butter, you can trade milk futures, um, you can trade uh, palladium and platinum, um, you can trade natural gas. So there's other futures contracts that you can trade, and obviously the index, but, which we'll talk about next week in our teachings for June 2017 content. But for commodities, these are the ones I like to highlight. These are the ones I had historically in my basket that I like to look at. Um, there were some quirky little things that I did with the thinner markets like canola and rice where I would use the open interest decline on that to frame whether or not the, the grain complex was bullish or bearish. And back in the early 90s, I felt that there was validity to that, and I actually used it in my teaching material then. Uh, over the years, I've learned that that wasn't entirely true. It just means at the time, all the grains were going up because all commodities were going up. So it, it was a drought across the board. In the 90s and it just caused all kinds of problems for uh, all the grains so that's why they all went up and any open interest decline you know i was erroneously attributing the open interest decline in canola and rice as supporting roles to why wheat and soybeans and corn should go higher and that's not true i used the same thing with oats uh, i would look at oats and i would look for the open interest decline there and that would support bullishness for the grain complex and I can tell you I was very, very wrong by teaching that stuff back then. I didn't know what I was doing. And now because I've been looking at this stuff for over two decades, I know that open interest is directly related to only that particular market. Uh, after all, it's the open interest of that commodity, not something that can be shared an idea of. So I've learned over the years a lot 
about how these markets work and operate. And when I was on America Online, I thought I had everything figured out as a early neophyte, <laughs> but I didn't have much of an understanding at all, actually. But uh, in my opinion, these seasonal tendencies have held up very, very well over the last 20 plus years. I'm going to counsel you to come to your own conclusion whether or not there's any validity to them. The best way I can tell you to use them is use everything else we've done so far in the mentorship, blend these things together. If we know that there's a seasonal impact for prices to move higher for a particular commodity, and you know which ones they are, every year when you get a calendar, okay, or you can just program it in your in your phone. If you have a smartphone, just put it in your smartphone and at the beginning of every month. Make a list of all the seasonal tendency influences that you should be expecting for that particular month. That way, every month when you sit down in your charts, you say, okay, well, seasonally, this is a good time for this particular market to go higher or this particular market to go lower. And then go into your analysis and see, don't force it, but look and see if there's reasons to justify that seasonal tendency. Here's the wonderful takeaway. If it's not you know, basically following the seasonal tendency, it's telling you something. Either it's going into a long-term consolidation, which you can't make money with, or if it's not consolidating, if it's going the opposite direction, that means there's very significant strength if the seasonal tendency is calling for lower prices and it's not doing that, it's going higher, it's actually telling you something. There's a strong demand for that commodity. Check and see if it has net long positions in the commercials. As we discussed so far in the beginning of this month, I give you ways to look at the hedging program. Wait for them to go into a hedging buy program and go in and, and test your discount arrays and see if you can get any movement off of that. So hopefully you've learned something from this teaching. Uh, I can't tell you how richly these graphs have blessed my understanding of the marketplace over the last two decades. And I'm sure if you study them and hold them you know, close to your heart like I did, they'll serve you equally well, if not better. And until next lesson, I wish you good luck and good trading.